coming to Science Saturdays. This is a really exciting day for me because this is the first time I've talked about science in front of my kids. So I, I, I usually talk about science to students or to scientists, but uh, this is the toughest audience I think I'm ever going to face uh, ever. So yeah, so the title uh, of our, our, our show or our talk today is Small, Sticky, and squishy, okay? So some of you have already seen how this comes to play outside. But before we start, I want to uh, thank uh, a, ne a, a number of people. So you might recognize all these faces here. These are the people that helped with the uh, squishy specific demos out in the hallway and who made the bucket of cornstarch outside. Um, there are also some people that aren't here today uh, in the engineering school who helped contribute some resources. We've got support from Yale Center for Engineering, Innovation, and Design, and also a big thank you and a shout out to the National Science Foundation who pays for our research and helps support these outreach activities. Okay, so now we've got the thank you out of the way. Uh, let's start talking about some science, okay? And so I want to start off with a question for all of you to think about, and that question is, how does a drop of water behave? So what does a drop of water do? It drops. What else does it do? Just shout it out. Don't raise your hand. You're all right. OK? So when I say a drop of water, you might think of a small drop of water, like a little tiny drop of dew on a blade of grass or a drop of dew on a spider web. And in that case, drops of water don't do much except just sort of sit there and have a round shape, right? But what if I make my drop bigger? What's the, can you think of what a bigger drop of water would look like? Yes. Should I just shout out what it might be? A raindrop. A raindrop? What about that? What's that? A river. Uh, it could be a river. It's actually a lake. A lake is just a really big drop of water. Is it doing the same thing as the little, the smaller drop? Yes and no, right? So yes, it's just sort of sitting there, mostly. But it's not a big round sphere, right? It's really flat. So there's a difference between a big drop of water and a little drop of water. Can someone think of something, a, a drop of water that's even bigger than a lake? An ocean, right? So oceans look, behave totally differently from a lake or a drop of dew. They're all just water, right? Except the ocean is huge. And the funny thing that happens with the ocean is you get all these crazy waves. And those crazy waves happen just because the drop of water is bigger. Okay? So one of the things I want you to remember just from today, if you only remember one thing, remember that small and big are different. You probably already know that small and big are different because they're different sizes, but small things made out of the same stuff as big things can behave differently. Okay? And um, physicists and engineers and chemists sort of structure everything they think about about how big it is, okay? So here's a map of basically everything, right? I have, this is a scale where in meters, so I have the biggest thing you can imagine, actually it's, it's actually a small fraction of the universe, this is the Milky Way, it's one with 21 zeros after it meters across, right? And on the other side, I've got the inside of a proton, which is one of the smallest things inside of an atom, right? And that's one divided by one with 15 zeros after it. Okay, so it's a huge range. And somewhere in between around one meter is my daughter, Anwen, who's sitting right there. Um, and if you just go from Anwen to uh, this, just this tiny little bit difference from here to here is the difference between my daughter and East Rock, right? And this from here to here is the difference from East Rock to all of the Northeast. So imagine how big this stuff is. This is really big stuff. And similarly on this side, it's really, really tiny stuff. And what we do as physicists and chemists and all that stuff is try to figure out how these things are different. Okay, so now I want to talk, uh, so that was a little shtick about small and big. I want to focus on one particular aspect of small and big right now. And I want to talk about why this drop of water is all rounded up, a little drop, why a little drop rounds up, even though a lake is nice and flat. So does anyone have a guess why a lake is flat? Why is a lake flat? Or a shirt? Because um, the water has to make room for all the It's going to fall down because of gravity, right? It's going to make room by falling down for gravity. Something else is going on on the little stuff, okay? 
I'm going to move on. We can talk after. So, all right. So, uh, okay. So, if you have, imagine that you have like a crazy microscope that, you, like, that you can see so good you can see atoms and molecules. If you zoom in to water, okay. If you zoom into water and look at the surface of water, it might sort of look like something like this, okay. All the little um, blue circles are uh, meant to look like water molecules. Water molecules actually look like Mickey Mouse, but that's harder to draw. So I just made them spheres, okay? So if you look at this, these water, these molecules are inside of the drop of water. Up here, there's no water. And then here's the drop, the atoms or molecules on the surface. What's the difference between the molecules on the surface from the ones inside? Blue shirt. Um. Okay. Thea. Um, the ones on top get more sunlight. Oh, the ones in the bottom. that's true. <laughs> that's true. Great. That's not the thing I was going to point out. Okay. So I'm going to have to keep moving quick. Sorry. Unfortunately, we can't have lots of discussion here because there's lots to share. So molecules inside of condensed phases, like liquids and solids, like to make bonds with each other. Okay. They like to make bonds. That's good in terms of energy. And the molecules that are inside of the material, the bonds are represented as these little red lines. So this one on the inside has six neighbors he can make bonds to, so he's really happy, okay? Or she's really happy. Um, the, uh, the water molecule on the surface only has four friends instead of six. Okay, so he's not as happy. Okay, so these molecules on the surface aren't as happy because they can't make as many bonds, okay? So poor molecules. So what do they do? They try to get off of the surface, okay? So imagine that I made, I had a, a sheet of water, okay? And uh, I have a picture on the top and a picture on the bottom. They have the same number of water molecules, okay? The one on the top has a lot more unhappy molecules because there's a lot more surface. That's the ones that are slightly different color than the one on the bottom. What's the difference between the top and the bottom? What did the, what did the water sheet have to do? Way in the back. Yeah, you. Yeah, how, 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 does it, how does it get less water on the surface? What does it have to do? Orange shirt. It has to widen. Yeah, exactly. It widens this way, and it gets skinnier that way. Okay? Does that make sense? See, there are less white dots here than there are there. So the water, there are more happy water molecules. So it turns out that there's this force called surface tension that surfaces apply to the rest of the liquid that pull the liquid film in to try to make as few molecules as possible on the surface, okay? And we, uh, right now we have a few demos uh, that we're gonna show you. Uh, Dr. Larry Wyland, or Dr. Bubble, as he likes to be known, is gonna do a few demos here with the overhead projector, first showing off how surface tension works like this. Okay, so I've got a ring here with a string tied between it. We see that gravity likes to pull the string down, but now we're going to dip it in a solution. And what we have here is a soap bubble on both sides of the string, and because of this surface tension force, it's pulling on the string from both directions. But because it's pulling on both sides, gravity still wants the string to hang downward. But I'm going to pop the soap bubble on the bottom, and I want you to watch carefully what happens to the string. Okay, everybody see that it got pulled upward, and that's the force of surface tension in action. And then if I pop the one on top, it drops back down. So you can see surface tension in action. It's a pretty strong force. It can actually lift up the weight of that string. Do it again, Larry. Okay, I'll do it again. <laughs> I just checked the time. We're okay. <laughs> All right, so I've got it again. Maybe I'll turn it this way this time, just to show you that it works. And I'll pop the one on the bottom. And, there. and I'll pop the one on the top. And it drops back down. Okay, so that's And then, of course, somebody asked me to blow a bubble, so we can blow regular bubbles. And regular bubbles have this nice shape of being a sphere because a sphere is, if we enclose some area, is the shape that minimizes the amount of surface area. So it solves the mathematical problem of minimizing surface area because of that force 
the, the, the bubbles wants to pull together and minimize the amount of surface that has those, you know, that, that has those unhappy molecules with less bonds on them. Um, so I'm going to show you one or two more demos. We're going to use this overhead projector. It's high technology. Um, um, so some of you have seen some of these outside, but when you make a soap bubble between two plates that are clear, like plexiglass, that have pins in them, the soap bubble likes to connect those pins. And it will do so in a way that will minimize the distance. Okay, everybody see that soap bubble right there? It minimizes the distance between two points. And we all know that the answer to that is a straight line. So that's a very simple mathematical problem. But we can see what happens if we want to connect three points. Okay, and that's the shape of a soap bubble that is the shortest distance connecting three points. And so that, of course, is a Y, because here we are at Yale, and so. <laughs> um, so these are interesting. But I'm just going to kind of give you an advertisement for coming back outside afterwards and show you some more complicated kinds of problems you can solve. Obviously, I can put as many pins in as many different geometries as I'd like onto these plates. So I'll show you some that you can see outside, and then I'll just finish with one last demonstration that's more three-dimensional. Um, we could. We can have pins that represent big cities in the United States, and we can ask a question of what's the best way to connect all these cities with optical fiber for running all your computers. And the soap bubbles will solve that maybe in about the same time as some computers. Um, and then we can also ask what if we have many pins that are arrayed in sort of a uh, uh, a regular way that we call like a crystal lattice, and this will solve some other problems in physics and mathematics. Hey, Barry, we're yeah. doing better on time than I thought. So if you want to, oh, do we're doing better on time. So uh, then I'm going to actually do the one with four pins, um, which looks simple, but it's quite interesting. And I don't know if anybody has guessed the best way to connect up four pins, but it's not maybe what you originally thought. Um, an interesting thing about this solution is that the original problem with four pins has things that we call symmetries. You can rotate by 90 degrees, or you can flip over, and those pins have the exact same pattern. But the solution does not respect those symmetries. If I rotate the solution by 90 degrees, it actually is different from the one we see there. It looks like that. Um, however, we can connect between the two. So do we not? Okay. So I'm just going to finish now with a more three-dimensional demonstration. Some of the kids already saw this outside. Uh, we can take a um, cube here and dip it. Can everybody see that bubble? I'll dip another one that's a little bit larger. I'll keep holding this one up. Okay, yeah. And I'll try to do this. I just popped it. I just popped it. And if I'm careful, I'll just try one more thing for fun. I will dip this again. And now I can produce a bubble where I have a cube inside a cube. Woo! Okay. Sir. 
are not as happy as molecules inside of the material, and how that can make some pretty cool shapes. And that's actually the force that makes that drop of water round up. So we have a really small drop of water, that surface tension force is strong enough to beat gravity, and so it rounds up. But if you have a big drop of water, there's just not as many enough things on the surface to beat gravity, so it stays nice and flat. Okay, but uh, surface tension is not important just for liquids, and a lot of you might have heard of surface tension in the context of bubbles before. It's also really important in terms of solid materials, too, and this is what ties in to the research that I'm doing in my own laboratory. And uh, but first I want to, uh, and I'll, I'm going to motivate it with sort of a little thought experiment here. And that here we have uh, one material sort of against nothing. It's like air on one side. But now imagine if I put two different types of materials next to each other. Okay? There's a green material on top of the blue material. The green material up on the top can connect with all its other green friends. Okay? So it's very, very happy. Um, the blue blob of material can connect with lots of friends of the same color. The ones that are on the surface of the blue, which are gray, can make connections with the green ones too. They might be stronger, actually they might like to be with the green more than they want to be with the blue, or they might like to be with, the they're with themselves more. My point here is that even when you have two materials next to each other, there is a surface tension between two different materials. And, uh, this is actually how sticky notes work, okay? So in a sticky note, you have the back, the back side of the sticky note is this sticky material, right? That sticky material has a surface tension, okay? And it turns out that that material is really happy when you put it against another solid surface, okay? So uh, it, can make, it can make bonds with the other material. They're not as strong as the bonds that it makes with itself, but it's enough to make that sticky note stick to the wall. Okay? And uh, one of the things that uh, we're working out in my lab is basically how to make better sticky notes. Right? How do you make sticky notes that are stronger, or sticky notes that can be used in biomedical applications? Not sticky notes, but imagine, you know, it, is it fun taking off a Band-Aid? No. no. Really? Yeah. It depends on if you're the person who's wearing the band-aid yeah. or the person taking off the band-aid. Right? Okay. Anyway, it might be the same person. It's especially not fun when you're taking it off yourself, right? So what if we had like band-aids that like didn't hurt when you could take them off? Wouldn't that be awesome? Yeah. yeah, okay. So we're trying to understand how these things work. And one of the key things that happens is what happens microscopically of with how the sticky note touches the surface. And I want to show you a really cool movie that Dr. Kate uh, from my lab made, which uh, she couldn't come today. But this is a really nice movie. So this, this, is, um, this little sphere is really tiny, OK? Take one of your hairs and imagine that your hair, some, a, imagine a little ball that's 10 times smaller than the width of your hair. So it's a really, really, really small ball, OK? And she brings this little ball, and we're looking at it with a microscope, and we're bringing it in the back of a sticky note, okay? And we're asking, well, what does that look like? We want to understand exactly how these, this, this, this surface sticks to the back of a sticky note, okay? So I'm going to play the movie, and it's sort of cool what happens. So now she's pushing her sphere into the sticky note, and then she's pulling it out. Okay? <laughs> It made that sound. That was me. Um, so what, what does this what does this look like to you? Yeah, great, awesome. Yeah, and the sound effects always win. Does this look like a solid material to you? Yes, you've got the theme, right? The people who said kind of. All right. So someone shout out why they think this looks like a solid material. Just shout it out. Because it went like this? Because it doesn't go like it goes like one Uh huh. Yeah, and it has a preferred shape. Um, why does it look like a liquid? Uh, black shirt with gray stripes in the back. Sticky notes, uh, 
the, 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 the material has aspects of both the liquid and the solid, and we're trying to understand how all of that stuff works. Um, this is one way that a material can both be like a liquid or a solid, uh, and now we have a whole bunch of other examples uh, that we're going to give you about how uh, materials can act like a liquid or solid. So I want to start off by talking about solids work. So I'm just going to take my rubber ball and, oh wait. <laughs> 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 Did anybody see where my rubber ball went? Yeah. It's right here. It melted. It wasn't there. Wow, that's sort of weird, right? <laughs> oh my God! Is it a liquid or a solid? Solid. It's a solid because it has a shape. two pieces, okay? But why is it acting like a liquid? Blue shirt. Yeah, you. Yeah, you. So if you, it's hard, if you stare at this ball, you can't really see it changing its shape. But if you take a picture every 10 seconds or 20 seconds or a minute for an hour and a half, you can capture the whole process of this ball sort of oozing, right? So here, when I, when I, when I slow down, when I take a slow movie and I speed it up really fast, it looks like a liquid. But if I do things quickly, it acts like a solid. So if you do things fast, it acts like a solid. If you do things slowly, it acts like a liquid. Any, any questions about that? Yeah, blue shirt. What is it made of? Great question, excellent. So that's the big, so yeah, so that's the big question. What is the stuff made of? Why does it act like a liquid, but is so darn slow. <clears throat> Anybody have ideas? In the back, standing up. Because it's a solid melting at room temperature. As the solid melts, it's going to become more and more liquid. It's not going to become completely liquid. It's going to dissolve into a clay, muddy looking substance. Yeah, so, okay, so the interesting thing here is that the temperature is actually not changing. So, right now, is that room temperature, right? And it bounces, and if I leave it here over time, it's going to stay at room temperature and it's going to sag again. So this is a very different type. It's an excellent hypothesis, but this is a very type of solid to liquid transition. It doesn't happen with temperature. It happens with time. In fact, it's really just a liquid the whole time. It just goes really, really slowly. Any other hypotheses about why this thing is so slow? Oh, little guy with the white shirt. Yeah. All right, he withdraws. Any other hypothesis? Hat. Um, maybe because it's thick. Uh-huh. It's thick. Yeah, OK. Um, it's heavy. It's heavy. Yeah, you can pick it up. It's not that heavy. So let's talk about thick. If you're going to make something that's thick, what do you want to do? How do you make it thick? Blue shirt again. Yeah, okay, so why don't I show you what a picture of what this thing looks like. Zoom in, okay? So now we're zooming in really, really deep. Like, so this scale bar is a nanometer, okay? So it turns out that unlike water molecules, which are basically little spheres that sort of look like Mickey Mouse, but basic little spheres, these molecules in this material are really long. They're like yarn, okay? If you have lots of pieces of long yarn and you dump them into a container, what happens to them? Yeah, right there. Um, they also really settle in because of gravity. They settle in because of gravity. And what else? When you want to get one of them out, what happens? Yeah. You get tangled 
they get tangled, okay? So in this material, this material is made out of really long, stringy molecules called polymers, okay? And polymer is just word for really long, stringy material. And they're so long that they get all tangled up, okay? So gravity's pulling this down, but because they're tangled, it takes a really, really long time, okay? Make sense? Okay, so this is solid if you do things quickly and liquid if you go slowly. And the difference between solid and liquid is about an hour. It takes a, a, really an hour for it to act like, um, like a, uh, a liquid. We're going to show you another material now that uh, has a difference between being a solid and a liquid on a lot shorter time scale. So let me see if I can figure out what button to press. Is that the right button? Yep. Have I the screen? Ta-da! There it is. Okay. All right. So we're going to show you one uh, another sort of funny demo. Is this one water? Okay. Great. So this is Young Wu. Everybody say hi, Young Wu. Hi. Young Wu is uh, studying to get a PhD in chemical engineering. Okay. Is it chemical engineering? Great. Okay. And inside of this beaker, he has blue water. Woo! Blue water. Excellent. All right, great. And, uh, and, and what's this thing that he's holding? A syringe. A syringe. What do you do with a syringe? Yes. Yeah, you can you can inject stuff, and before you inject, you have to suck it out. So can you show everybody just how you suck up water with a syringe? So he sticks the water into he sticks the syringe into the water and he pulls up. And if he pulls the syringe out of the water and keeps and he keeps pulling, does he keep getting more water in? What does he get? Air. Air. Right? Do it one more time. Great. So is water a liquid? Yeah. Yes. yeah. Okay. So now we're going to take a material that looks like this. Okay? This is what we call a polymer solution. Okay? So it's got those same long molecules that get tangled up, but there's not as many of them. So they don't get tangled up with each other. They just get tangled up with themselves. So it makes it act like a solid only if you do things really quickly, okay? And like in less than a second, it's going to act like a solid, but more than a second, it's going to act like a liquid. So let's see what happens when Young Yu tries to pull that into this room. <laughs> So he's still pulling. When he pulls the syringe out of the liquid, it keeps getting pulled up. So if you can't see it right here, you can see it on the screen. Let's do it again for everybody. So it's sort of like in this case, pulling, why is this act acting like a solid? When you use the syringe, yep, yeah, you want to tell, why is it acting like a solid? Because it's what? It's goo. Goo is sort of solid, exactly. Um, also, if this was a piece of yarn, a if you had a string made out of a solid, and you pulled the string made out of a solid, it'd be no problem pulling it up at all, right? Try to pull out a, a string out of a liquid, it just doesn't work. So this thing that he's playing with is like 90% water and only 10% of this, but he can still just pull it up because it's just barely a liquid. And if he does it too slowly, it will just break. Cool. Thank you, Young Wu. Awesome. Okay, so we've got two different materials. Okay, this oh, see, is starting to droop a little bit. My rubber balls are not looking so rubbery. They both are fast when you go short uh, over short times, and they're uh, sorry, they're, they're they're solid over short times, liquid on a long time, but they have different times for the transfer. Now we're going to tell you about another material, right? If I remember correctly. Uh, we're going to talk about cornstarch, which is also known as oobleck. And uh, let me introduce my colleague, uh, Professor Eric Brown, he's from the Department of Mechanical Engineering. You can call him Dr. Squishy if you want. Or Dr. Messy. Yeah, I'm a little messy today. You might have seen me playing out by the cornstarch pool outside. So I'm going to tell you a lot more about cornstarch. And this is, this is a very fun material to play with. Also has solid and liquid-like properties. Uh, so my colleague here, uh, Dr. Bai, uh, he's going to show you uh, what happens when you mix cornstarch and water. And I'll start your time there. Sorry. Okay. Just a moment. So he's he's mixed some cornstarch and water together in this bowl, and you can see it's kind of 
wobbling around there, sloshing around like a like a fluid, right? So that looks to me kind of like milk or something, right? Yeah. Right? And what if he stirs it slowly? Yeah. So we can add some food to powder. <laughs> oh, this is gonna look pretty. Yeah. <laughs> So this still looks like a liquid, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. What if he stirs it faster? Maybe even faster. Okay. <laughs> you know, maybe be hit. Yep. <laughs> So actually, if he hits it, it's it's kind of hard, right? Right, Dr. Bai? Yep. Yeah, kind of a hard material, right? It, it almost feels like a solid if you hit this stuff. And you guys, you don't have to take our word for it. You can go outside and play with it after, later. Yeah, so it feels really hard. So he's going to switch one out here for us. Okay, let's actually, even for this one, if you move it fast, you can see the crack. Oh, so before, because it's a green color, it's hard to see that. Yeah. So what kind of material is cracked? Do you guys remember? Solid. 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 Yeah. So so it, it has properties of both liquids and solids, right? Yeah. So it can flow like a liquid, but it's hard and it can crack like a solid. Yeah, this one cracks even more. So we can try to play a little bit. Check that out. Well, you can almost pick it up like a solid, but then it melts and it has its hand. So again, it's, it's very solid-like, but it can melt like a liquid. Okay. So, so you guys can play with this stuff at home. You can buy cornstarch at a grocery store, put it in a bowl, just add some water. About 50% water, 50% cornstarch, and you guys can play with this home. You can do all sorts of stuff with it. You can stir it, you can hit it, you can try and like make a ball out of it and throw it around. You'll make a big mess in your kitchen. It's great. Okay, so next I want to show you one of the fun things you can do with this stuff. Um, this one is a little harder to do at home, um, but, but uh, what we got uh, uh, right here is some cornstarch and water on a speaker. This is like a stereo speaker, and we're going to shake that speaker. And so, so again, it looks like a liquid at first, and if we shake it slowly, does it still look like a liquid? Yes. Yeah, it still looks like a liquid to me. What if we shake it a little harder? Yeah, now it's going. What's it doing? Whoa. Did liquid do that? It looks like liquid greens. Yeah, it's like liquid greens too. Yeah, I, I thought liquids were supposed to make, like, like if you look at a lake, right? They make a flat surface, right? It's not doing that anymore.
But the person's not sinking in, right? They're walking on it like it was a solid. <laughs> so this is a cool thing you can do with a material that can behave both like a fluid and like a solid. But you have to move pretty fast. So this is different than the silly putty you saw before. That silly putty is still melting. Out in that cornstarch pool, you have to move fast. You have to keep running like this to stay up. If I stop running in that, I'm going to sink right in. So, so you have to keep moving fast to keep that like a solid. But if you sink in, well, you, you might sink to the bottom, and you might, I don't know, you might have a hard time getting out. You'll have to try it afterwards. This is a fun experiment to try out. So I'm going to try it out afterwards. That will let you guys know. Okay, so I, I want to try to explain a little bit about what's going on here. At least what we understand about these materials. So if I if I were to put cornstarch particles under a microscope, I get a picture that looks like that. So these are actual cornstarch particles. They look like tiny rocks. The, the scale here, this is one ten thousandth of a meter. This is a little smaller than the thickness of your hair. It's too small to see the particles by eye. So they're really tiny. They're just a bunch of little tiny rocks. And if I put them in a liquid, like in the top right picture there, they kind of float around. And like you saw, it looked kind of like milk. It looks still like a liquid. Those particles are just floating around. But what happened when we, when we moved it fast? So we, we stirred it fast, or we shook it, or, or someone stepped on it. What happens is you push those particles together. And if you push them together fast enough, you can kind of jam them together like a solid. So they're all pushed together in that bottom picture there. And then if they're all stuck together like that, they can act like a solid because they're hard particles. So, so then you can have something that's hard, it can even crack like a solid. It can hold up someone's weight if they try to run across it fast enough. But you have to keep pushing them together to do that. If you let go, if, if you stop stirring or stop pushing, then those particles are just going to float away again, and you're going to have that top picture again. So you have to keep pushing them fast to get them to stay like a solid. So this is kind of what we understand about how these materials work. A, a cool application of these materials, cornstarch and water. So, um, so, so we, again, we do a lot of experiments with these things, and we try to figure out what, what are these materials good for, right? So, so we came up with an idea one day, and, and actually, I can't take credit for this. Other people of this idea, but but these cornstarch and water materials might be good for protecting things. So, Dan is going to do an experiment for us. She's going to she has this egg in a plastic bag with water. And she's going to show us what happens if you drop an egg in the water. And what's going to happen? Ooh. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Check that out. <laughs> now we got a cheese egg, yeah. Who's hungry? That's a shoe. Alright. So, yeah, so, so the water did not protect that egg at all. Right? So, so water is, is not good. Like if you wanted to make a helmet or some, some padding, you would not make it out of water, right? You'd be a scrambled egg afterwards. So, so now with cornstarch, what's going to happen? Any guesses? Alright, might break, might not break. So we're going to do the experiment to find out. Right. That sounded pretty hard. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
won't fall from the ceiling and have that protect me, but it, it could protect you a little bit, right? So, so this is one of the things we do. We try to study this stuff and try to understand what we can do with it. Okay? And you'll get a chance to meet some of us today. So, have fun. Thank you. 